The Technical Porcelain and Chinaware Company, also known as TEPCO, was founded in 1918 by John Battista Pagliero. The plant was located at 6416 Manila Avenue, El Cerrito, California, across the street from the Pagliero home. This movie was filmed in 1941 by John's stepson, Alex Marchegio, to show the inner workings of the TEPCO China factory. I'm Jill Lucchetti Bauza. John Pagliero was married to my great-grandmother, Victoria Cabiani Marchegio. And now, in the year 2008, I'm here to tell you a little story about him and his fascinating porcelain company, TEPCO. John Pagliero was born in 1882 in the Piedmont countryside north of Turin, Italy. In 1908, he and his brother immigrated to California, where they both found work at the Carnegie Brick and Pottery Company in San Joaquin County. The building supply trades were booming during the restoration of San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake. So in 1918, John, who by this time was the superintendent of a porcelain casting plant, established Tepco in his backyard. He hired a two-man crew to dry press porcelain in a hand-operated screw press. By 1925, John Pagliaro had left his superintendent's job and moved TEPCO to a site alongside the Santa Fe Railroad track. Most of the raw ingredients for the standard clay body came from the east. Railroad cars of Georgia Kaolin, Old Hickory, Kentucky Ball Clay, North Carolina Feldspar, and West Virginia Silica were uncoupled on the TEPCO spur and the contents emptied into crushers. Suction conveyors vacuumed the materials into silo-like tanks, which held 35 carloads. Raw ingredients measured according to a master recipe were carried in batch cars to 3,000 gallon burstone line ball mills. These mills were like enclosed cement mixers filled with smooth stones. They ensured an intimate mixture of finely ground materials suspended in a 50% water solution. After a two-day grind, the slip was drained through 300 mesh electromagnetic lawns or screens, which removed lumps and iron into underground agitator sumps, where it was aged to make it more workable. Some pumps sent the slip at high pressure through canvas filters that dewatered the clay and left it in cakes. Peeled from the filter press, the clay was tossed into a 10-ton capacity pug mill. 
whose rotating knives and vacuum chambers removed all trapped air. A continuous 8-inch square column of jigger-ready clay was pushed through the tapered extruding end of the mill. Three-foot lengths were cut and stacked on zinc-covered cards. The batter out and the jiggermen were piece workers on the line, and they wasted no time in attacking the clay columns. Armed with piano wire, the batter out worker cut the columns into stacks of one-half-inch blanks. He slapped each blank onto a flat plaster bat stomped it with a felt-covered cast-iron maul, and then passed the clay pancake to his partner at the jigger. The jiggerman centered the pancake on a whirling rosati mold, whose top surface gave shape to the face of the plate. Pasquale Rosati was the master mold maker at TEPCO. Once on the mold, the Jiggerman lowered a lever mounted with a steel template cutting the bottom and edge in sharp profile. Oval platters and bowls were thrown on eccentric jiggers. The custom shape took great skill to master. Cups, deep bowls, and other hollowware were jiggered in concave molds, whose inner walls shaped the item's outer surface. Cups were smoothed off and carefully inspected as they came from the jigger. It took keen hand and eye coordination to trim the wear just right.
1936 ledger shows TEPCO's rapid growth in sales as it produced more and more chinaware, and it phased out its electrical and technical porcelain lane, such as insulators and bathroom accessories that it had produced in the 1920s. Handles for cups and pitchers were produced separately, then applied and refined by hand. Each of the 16 Jiggermen, with his batter out partner, threw about 200 dozen pieces a day. For decades after, Eastern innovators had introduced completely automatic 12-head jiggers. But TEPCO methods remained hands-on until much later when a semi-automatic 2-head jigger was used. Rosati's early molds and the corresponding metal jigger tools produced exceedingly heavy wide-rimmed china, and when jiggered in dry, the ware had walls three-eighths of an inch thick.
Later, Rosati made molds that turned out thinner, lighter ware with scalloped edges and narrow rims, as well as coupes, which are rimless plates and bowls. The quarter-inch walls were semi-translucent. The jiggered ware was dried to chalk white in rooms heated by open front gas heaters. Finish your sponged and fettle plates in stacks, then pass them on a vibrating conveyor belt under cascades of sand, which worked itself between each piece. Covered with setting sand to minimize warping, and placed in refractory saggers and then onto kiln cars, the ware was fired to verification at 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. The donut shaped bisque kiln, a 180 foot continuous circle tunnel, had an open segment that allowed four men in two hours to remove bisque from the moving car and replace it with greenware before it re entered the tunnel. The car completed the circle in 56 hours. At its height, the Tepco factory could produce an amazing 30,000 dishes a day.
After bisque firing, the ware was no longer fragile, and the workers tossed it about with practice abandonment. Plates that had cracked in firing were quickly eliminated from the production line in a sort of industrial Darwinism. Setting sand which stuck to the wear during the bisque was removed by sandblasting. Conveyor belts carried smoothware past the stampers, who applied underglazed ink rubber stamps spelling TEPCO. A woman who had stamped for nine years said that TEPCO used a variety of other trademarks. These included P-A-C-E-C-O, PAMCO, Solano, Genesee, and a single Gothic letter P. This assortment purportedly was nothing more than a sales ploy. Bill Ekman worked for TEPCO for 27 years and was once foreman of the decorating shop. He recalled the different decorating processes. The early china was undecorated white or tan, or at most it had a few brushed on bands of brown, blue, red, or green underglaze. Later, transfer printing, airbrush, stencil, and underglaze decals were used. Bill Hoyt, the chief of the art shop, began each process with a drawing according to Palieros or a customer's specification. For an airbrush pattern, the drawing was cut into a flexible sheet of lead. Since each size and type of item required a different modular stencil assembly, the lead sheet could be cut into parts, which were then bound with wire and soldered. The upstairs decorating shop included 12 spray booths. In the tissue transfer process, a Hoyt drawing was engraved on a copper cylinder which was then chrome plated. The cylinder which was mounted on a printing press and inked with underglazed colorant dissolved in pine tar oil, printed patterns onto lengths of sheer strong tissue. After it came off the press, the tissue was dried on clotheslines. Then it was cut, laid in place, and pasted down on the wear with a film of soft lye soap. Decorators tossed the china into a tub of water, and when the tissue soaked free, it left the design clearly registered. Then the ware was ready for the glaze dippers. Working as a glaze dipper, Phil Ekman recalled, When I did piecework, I liked to start at dawn and get out by noon, and I could make a pretty good wage. He did this, of course, by dipping up to four plates in one hand, extending his reach and grip with several taped-on copper wire fingers. With several plates wedged firmly on hooks, he would swing his hand in an arc into and out of a tub of glaze, touching up any unglazed areas with the fingers of his free hand.
The two glossed kilns, 160 and 250 feet long respectively, were straight tunnels reaching 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. Kiln cars with the glazed dipped ware passed through them in 36 hours. The glazed ware was unloaded, inspected, and sent to distribution warehouses in Houston, Seattle, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. The dishes had a large surface for a growing number of decorative patterns on the shop's palette. At one point, Pagliaro offered 25 airbrushed patterns and over 30 tissue transfers. Underglazed decals with custom logos were also available. Many of the standard patterns were Western in theme. This is the Branding Iron series. Notice how the Branding Irons spell out TEPCO on the rim of the plate. It's possible that TEPCO was unaware of the tongue-in-cheek humor of some of its designs. For example, a guest at the White Log Tavern finishing his plate of rare roast beef might find himself staring down into a wagon train scene with the caption, Donner Party, 1846. Some series commemorated scenes of state and western history. This platter shows the Pony Express in action. TEPCO also created wear for numerous government agencies and restaurants, from the U.S. Forest Service to Bob's Big Boy. Restaurants in the West are still serving on TEPCO wear. Shelves at lunch counters and coffee shops are stacked with the thick, durable white or tan dishes. One of TEPCO's more well-noted creations outfitted Victor Bergeron with the original wear for his Polynesian-themed restaurant, Trader Vic's. Some creative examples are the Samoan Fog Cutter, the Hula Mug, and the Death's Head Mug for hot rum. The patent for this beauty was filed in 1939. There were many other decorative patterns and shapes designed. Here are just a few. My all-time favorite is this custom-created pattern, which was made in 1937 as a wedding gift from my grandparents, Norma Marquesia Mazzola and Primo Edward Mazzola. Throughout World War II, TEPCO supplied China to ships galleys of the United States Pacific Fleet, sailing from San Francisco. There were cups with four stars for admirals, two stars for rear admirals, and plates for chief petty officers and navy warrant officers. Each day, 30,000 pieces of china with blue ropes, flags, and anchors were packed with redwood shavings and oak barrels and rolled down the wooden ramps into navy trucks.
The calls, or rejects, were trucked for dumping to Point Isabel in Albany, California, where they can still be found some 90 years later. This large stretch of land is known as Tepco Beach. The beach is covered with sedimentary deposits of Tepco, China, to a depth of 8 to 10 feet, and is designated a regional treasure by the American Clay Association. The Steg Sanitary District had an easement for their disposal plant and gave TEPCO permission to dump broken pottery there as they needed the landfill. Almost to the end of his 85 years, John Pagliaro put on his knee-length brown cotton coat and walked the production line. Eventually, he turned his business operations over to his two sons. Arthur, the younger son, remained in El Cerrito, while Tony traveled to make major sales and to set up branch offices in Houston, Seattle, and Los Angeles. While at one time there was close to 200 workers at the plant, TEPCO was truly a family operation. John's nephew, Eddie Pagliaro, was the production superintendent, and his grandson, Butch Pagliaro, worked as a tool and die maker and later became foreman. And then there was Tony's wife, Delena, who kept all the books. Tony and Delina retired in the early 1960s, leaving Arthur to preside over TEPCO's dissolution. TEPCO shut down in 1968, the year John died. When the factory burnt down in 1946, it was replaced by a 200 by 500 foot structure, consisting of a low brick building for offices and a barrel vaulted reinforced concrete production room. The demolition company hired to raise it in 1970 went out of business while trying to destroy the incredibly well-built building. But it did finally fall, and the site is now covered by the Department of Motor Vehicles and a parking lot. The Technical Porcelain and Chinaware Company might be a part of California history, but the battle-tested China it produced will be in our lives forever. Thank you for listening to the TEPCO Story.